Americans elected Dwight D. Eisenhower president in 1952. Threatening the use of nuclear force, Eisenhower prodded the North Koreans into signing a ceasefire in 1953. By then, more than 54,000 Americans had lost their lives. Determined not just to contain, but to roll back communist expansion, President Eisenhower wanted to increase American military strength. But Ike also had promised to reduce government spending. How was he to increase the military without running up the national debt? Eisenhower found the answer by shifting from costly troops and conventional weapons to a reliance upon air power and nuclear weapons. This, said Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, would provide more bang for the buck. A new policy of massive retaliation threatened the Soviet Union and China with nuclear obliteration should they attack the United States or its allies. Afraid that the United States nuclear advantage would put them at the mercy of the United States, the Soviet Union accelerated its own missile program. The nuclear arms race was on. Fears soared as each country rushed to develop and test hydrogen bombs, a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bombs the United States had dropped on Japan at the end of World War II. The arms race between Soviets and Americans would last for close to 40 years. By the time the Cold War ended in 1991, it had cost trillions of dollars and created enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world many times over. Duck and cover. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? Duck and cover. Duck and cover. One of the unexpected, unanticipated outcomes of the war was the direct result of our use of the atomic bomb. We had unleashed into the world a force that had never been seen before. And for many of us, that was a terribly frightening force to have unleashed. And the possibility that people who did not share our value system might also get a hold of it and use it on us was a throbbing fear. The possibility of nuclear war struck terror in the hearts of Americans. When the air raid sirens blew, children were drilled to duck and cover. They crouched under their desks or marched to basement air raid shelters stockpiled with food and water. Some families built bomb shelters in their own backyards so they could live through a nuclear attack. This is a modern home. This is a prepared home in the nuclear age. The housekeeping problem of living in a shelter will begin as soon as the shelter is occupied. All shelters should include clothing, bedding, rubber sheets and special equipment for the sick, writing materials, reading materials, games and amusement for the children. No matter where you live, a fallout shelter is necessary insurance. It will not be needed except in an emergency, but in an emergency, it will be priceless, as priceless as your life. The bomb shelter was an eerie symbol of the nuclear family in the nuclear age. Families wanted to seal themselves off from the growing dangers of the outside world. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It was the $64,000 question. Answer correctly, and your life might return to normal give the wrong answer, or refuse to answer at all, and your life was ruined. In the years following World War II, Americans' fear of communism and nuclear war led to mass hysteria, fueled by politicians and others who wanted Americans not only to support the war against communism, but also to view the world as they viewed it.
This was the country's second Red Scare, more intense than the fear that erupted after the communist takeover of Russia in 1917. Between 1945 and 1952, congressional committees conducted 82 hearings investigating communist influence in the entertainment industry, higher education, unions, and the federal government. The most infamous hearings began in 1947, when Congressman J. Parnell Thomas's House Un-American Activities Committee conducted hearings on communist influence in Hollywood. Calling the House Un-American Activities Committee to order, Chairman J. Parnell Thomas of New Jersey opens an inquiry into possible communist penetration of the Hollywood film industry. The committee is seeking to determine if Red Party members have reached the screen with subversive propaganda. I want to emphasize at the outset of these hearings that the fact that the Committee on Un-American Activities is investigating alleged communist influence and infiltration in the moving picture industry must not be considered or interpret it as an attack on the industry itself. A long list of prominent motion picture witnesses appear before the committee. Speaking for the films, Eric Johnston, president of the Motion Picture Association, talks frankly concerning the attitude of the producers. We are accused of having communists and communist sympathizers in our employ. Undoubtedly, there are such persons in Hollywood, as you will find elsewhere in America but we neither shield nor defend them. We want them exposed. Witnesses were forced not only to tell about their own activities and beliefs, but to talk about their friends and co-workers. Invoking the First Amendment, which protects the right to freedom of speech, a group of Hollywood writers and directors known as the Hollywood Ten went to jail rather than answer questions about their political beliefs. Today, we call the anti-communist hysteria of the post-war McCarthyism, a name synonymous with the excesses of Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin. Between 1950 and 1954, McCarthy ran a campaign of terror from his Senate subcommittee that curbed free speech, ruined many people's lives, and made people afraid to express political opinions different from hostile anti-communists. McCarthy's reckless and undocumented accusations against government employees and others won him tremendous political power and public support. Very few had the courage to speak out against McCarthy. One of the first was Margaret Chase Smith, a Republican senator from Maine, who condemned communist witch hunts on the Senate floor on June 1, 1950. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Those of us who shout the loudest about Americanism in making character assassinations are all too frequently those who, by our own words and acts, ignore some of the basic principles of Americanism. The right to criticize. The right to hold unpopular beliefs. The right to protest. The right of independent thought. Margaret Chase Smith. Despite its excesses, the Red Scare dragged on for years. McCarthy's fall from power finally came in 1954, when he went after supposed communists in the U.S. Army. I resent very, very much this attempt to connect the great American Army with this, this attempt to uh, sabotage the efforts of this committee's investigation into communism. Americans watching the hearings on television were appalled by McCarthy's bullying of witnesses and falsification of evidence. No longer finding him a political asset, Republican senators joined their Democratic colleagues in a formal censure of McCarthy. His reign of terror was over. Years of investigations and hearings turned up few actual communists. But the second Red Scare did cost thousands of people their jobs and created a pervasive atmosphere of fear. The anti-communists attacked not just alleged Communist Party members and sympathizers, but labor unions and school teachers, civil rights workers, new dealers, and others who questioned the directions that American post-war society was taking. 
The entertainment industry avoided controversy by blacklisting hundreds of people. Hollywood and television stopped making films and shows dealing with social issues and stepped up production of lighthearted musicals and comedies and action adventures with law and order and anti-communist themes. Conformity and consensus, a coercive narrowing of public speech and opinion, came to dominate American life. But even as the Red Scare gripped the nation, events in the American South were laying the groundwork for perhaps the greatest social movement of the 20th century.